DeVabry and Jackson here, DBJ, uh, as I am known, man with the name hard to say. I've been holding on to this narrative secret for quite some time, and I was afraid that if I revealed this secret, um, it would be abused, it would break the immersion, but I promised myself that I would do uh, some of these videos and uh, for those who have been following me I haven't done a video in quite some time so this is going to be a special treat this might be a little long but I'll get to the point All right, the GM or DM as the inner voice now what this uh, secret is not it is not the player character making the inner voice for themselves it's not a soliloquy it's not the inner thoughts it's not their dreams and hopes it's not uh, their emotions after a, you know, a pitched battle and they see all the dead bodies. This is not that particular technique. This is the GM or the DM acting as the inner voice of the player. And I can guarantee you that your best GMs and DMs use this technique. Matter of fact, it's probably one of the top five techniques used out there ever and should be in your tool bag. Those of you who, um, have a lot of followers out there. I would love to hear your opinion. You guys doing blogs, um, videos, video blogging, whatever. Um, please don't be afraid to take this video, put it in your own words, share it out there. Um, respond back. I would love to hear what you think and would love to hear this technique in the voice of others out there. Um, doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the gaming community. Now, let's hit a couple of points up front. And then I'll go through each one individually as examples, uh, so you can guys guys don't have to look at the whole video again. Number one, let's go to the bad stuff first, right? Uh, the the GM acting as the inner voice allows you to avoid die rolls. It also allows you to railroad your players or kind of insert the quantum ogre, however you want to call it. Um, it can be overused, uh, but the inner voice can never lie, and it should never be abused as a, as a tool, as this particular secret, and you never want to overdo it. But specifically, the great stuff is that this allows you to spotlight any and all of your players during the game, allows you to insert exposition, to add flavor to your setting, to offer lots of, of information, all that combined together to your players, and from that player through everyone else, um, allows you to use all five senses of one or more of your player characters and allows you to spotlight the expertise of the character, not the player, but the characters within your gaming world, within your setting, and the, the skills that they've um, amassed if they've played in your game for quite a while. And it avoids that, that annoying question of, are you the game master or DM asking, are you sure you want to do that? All right. So let's start off with avoiding die rolls. Now, players who hear this are going to say, well, I made up my character. I've got all these bonuses. Why would I want to avoid a die roll? Expert game masters out there know you, you, you never ask for a die roll if there's no reason to have a failure or success for the outcome, right? If it's not going to further the story, don't have a die roll, right? If there's a locked door, and the only way to... If there is a doorway, and the only way to get through the adventure is to go through the door, don't have the door locked. Because... If the players fail to open the door, you're, you're setting yourself up and the players up for failure and frustration. Now, what do I mean by avoiding die rolls? Okay, Let's get into some specifics here. Here's how I would avoid a die roll. Using the DM as the inner voice. Say you have a player character playing as fighter, Dungeons and Dragons. He's got a 16, 17 strength or something. And I say to them, you go to reach for the door, it's jammed shut, swollen from moisture, from being underground into the dungeon. But you feel that if given enough pressure, you could probably force this door open. But it's been locked for a millennia, right? Okay. 
player character says, um, I try to force the door open. And then you describe what happens. What I did up front was I established that, yes, the door is shut. And it's wedged shut. You can't really open it. But you as the player character, who seems very strong, you feel you have the, the necessary strength to open it up. And I've already set up the conditions. Here's the, here's the fact. The door is closed. Here's the other fact. You know what? You're strong enough to open it. What do you want to do? Okay? Here's the other controversial thing, the railroad, the, the quantum ogre, the, the forcing players down a path that they may or may not want to go, okay? And I understand that those players out there listening to this video are going to, going to scream because the Game Master should not control what players do. But this is going to tie into expertise. Example. Player character is a ranger, hunter type, outdoorsman or something. And I say to them, you can take the mountain pass, although it is the quicker route. But you know that crossing the mountains, although more difficult, will, have, will allow you to avoid the uh, stone giant patrols that uh, live in the mountains and look for innocents that go through the mountain pass, right? So, what I've set up there is, you don't have to make a roll. You're already an outdoorsman. I've also set up something else. I gave you information. You already know about the stone giants that attack passers by in the mountain pass. Lastly, I've given you an option. You know what? Even though it seems harder, it's probably better if you go over the mountains. All right? And... Through different methods of using language, I mean, inference, you can say, you know, if you try to sneak into the castle, you're pretty sure you're going to be spotted. You're probably better off going through the dungeons. You know, okay, you're giving information as the, the game master or GM to the player, knowing full well the capabilities of the character, not the player. I'm not an outdoorsman. I don't know how to survive, but if I'm playing an 8th level ranger in Dungeons & Dragons, my character knows how to survive out in the wilderness and would know, hey, if I go down this way to the south, there are going to be spiders and snakes or something, or, hey, you see bear scat. There's probably a bear in the area without having to roll a die. All right? So, overuse. You don't want to overuse this technique because you can step on the creative, um, the, the creative gears that are flowing through your players. You want your players to come up with these ideas. But if they feel stuck, it's a great motivational tool. Um, but also you want to be able to spotlight the players. You know, if one player is playing a mage and he hasn't really had too much, much to do, you spotlight them and say, hey... You notice in the cave, you specifically, you player, notice in the cave, writing from an ancient time, and although they may be shamanic symbols, you are aware that this is a very powerful magic and may even be the precursor to what you've learned thousands of years later. So in that moment, the wizard is able to obtain that information. The wizard knows about this stuff, and then the wizard player character can then transfer that information to the rest of the party who of course can hear you because you're online or you know hangouts or you're at the table or something and they can all hear this but that information belongs to the wizard who gets the spotlight for having that as well as the fact that you can insert exposition um, I know a problem with getting across a ton of information about the setting and the world that you've made it's very difficult, you know, you, you can type up as many documents as you want, but your player characters really, your players will really not, they're not going to read it. We know that, they know that, you should know that, all right? So instead, through one, two, or three lines of uh, dialogue, you can impart information to your players. And then that information then gets imparted to everybody else because it becomes a part of your players, right? So... Going back to the example of the wizard, if you tell the wizard you go into the cave and there are shamanic symbols, 
now you've already established that the wizard has a f familiarity with these shamans. And you can even impart the name. The, you know, the, um, the Agathi shamans of the uh, river folk or something. Now that player automatically has that information and can incorporate that information into their background. Why would they know this? Uh, where did they learn it from? Or you learn this in wizard school. Oh, wow. So I was taught this from the wizard school. Yes. Or you can even go further. Your mentor, when you were just a teenager in wizard school, gave you a book. And you read this while sitting on the shores of the Wizard's Tower, reading about the Agathi um, River Shamans. And 20 years later, you've stumbled upon an ancient uh, crypt with these symbols. You're done. Okay? Later on in another game, you bring up a little bit more information, a little bit more information. And maybe you're, you're guiding them to go to this underwater kingdom or something. But you haven't gotten there yet. But you've given out this information to your players. And you can do this for each... For each character type, specifically the fighter, um, you haven't seen this fighting style um, before, but you remember being, when you were a teenager and in training, that the swordsman told you that he learned this style from the Agonthi swordsman from the Underwater Kingdom, right? Whatever. Okay. You can use this as their inner voice. Now, you... I must remind you that if, as the GM or DM acting as the inner voice, that inner voice can never, ever lie to them. They can never, ever be led down a path that they would not normally choose. The whole point of being that character's inner voice is that it is that character. And as the GM, you are acting as that little nudge, that little subconscious part in the back of their head, that little thing that says to them, you know what, maybe this isn't the right decision. Okay? And without having to say the words, are you sure you want to make this decision? Okay? It is, you cannot lie to the players. You cannot say, well, you know, you, your instincts are telling you go down the left corridor instead of the right, but you're not sure. You can't force them to go through the traps that you created. You can't force them to do these things because you will not only uh, break the immersion, but you will lead your players down a path of destruction and they will never ever trust in your storytelling ability again. Which is why I said at the top of the video, this is one of the most dangerous and sensitive and powerful tools, one of the top five tools in a, in a uh, GM or DM's library. Okay, let's get to um, talk about expertise, which I think is one of the most important, or the question of, are you sure you want to do that? All right, player characters going down the hallway, you hear noise down at the end of the hallway, one of the player characters says, I'm going to run down the hall, bust through the door, and attack who's ever in there. And you as the Game Master say, oh, I don't know, are you sure you want to do that? Although that is logical and probable and an easy way to find out the answer and to not lead your players down the path of destruction, there's an easier way and a far more fluid way without breaking the immersion of the game, right? So instead, you tell the, the fighter or the paladin who wants to save these people down a corridor, say, although your instincts to save the innocent are, are ringing in your head, instincts tell you that, is, that running down this dark corridor to bust the door is very dangerous. You, you know to be very careful, although every fiber of your being is telling you to run. You want to be careful going down this hallway, right? Or, let's go this to another way, because that was a really bad example, I think. Another way would be um, for expertise, and are you sure you want to do that? Now, I'm going to give you three scenarios, and you can decide for yourself what, quote-unquote, level, air quotes, the player character is, all right? So, hey, um... 
a uh, Dragus, you stumble out of the tavern having, you know, consumed your sixth pint of very powerful ale or grog or mead or something, and you are surrounded by cutthroats. Now, that's not a lot of information, but you can form that information based on the expertise, the senses, the that player character's own perception of what they are capable of, where they are, and what they can do. For example, hey, Dagus, you are surrounded by cutthroats. You know, even on your worst day, you can probably take on one or two of them, even barehanded, but you're not sure if he's got any friends around, and you reach down, realizing that you are unarmed. Or, you are surrounded by cutthroats. You see two of them in front of you. You know, and you've been assaulted this way. Even though you can't sense them, you know there's four or five more waiting in the shadows. Or, hey, Dagus, you stumble out of the, um, the tavern. A band of cutthroats surrounds you. Two of them are in front of you. Six behind you. Even unarmed. You know you could take these, these guys out on your worst day. So what I've done is, as the Game Master, I'm taking into account what their capabilities are. Maybe he's a second or third level character and he's surrounded by, you know, he's confronted by two cutthroats. Alright, he doesn't have a weapon on him. You know, could he fight him off barehanded? Maybe. They're probably going to pull knives. You're not sure. So, you couch that information, the uncertainty, in your description to them. Maybe they're mid-level, fifth to eighth level or something like that. Got no weapon on them, little drunk, two in front, but this person is experienced. And though you as the Game Master know there are others around that want to surround them maybe, get some information from them or something, you explain to them, hey, you don't notice this, but you're probably guessing with your experience that there are others nearby. The two in front of you, you can probably take them easily. The six around you that you know are there, you're probably going to have to disarm someone to get a weapon out of their hand. Lastly, maybe they're 10th level to 15th or higher. All right? Stumbles out of there. And using that information, you're like, hey, there's two cutthroats in front of you. You're guaranteed there's probably four to six more behind them. You know this. Why? You didn't, you didn't see it. You didn't hear it. You don't have extra senses. But you, you're a, a veteran warrior. And given the situation, that's what you would do. And so what, I, what you've done as the inner voice is you've taken the information, formed it into something that would, that how they would interpret it and given it to them without having to say the words, are you sure you want to do that? All right? As well as the fact that given the experience of each player character, you can then form that, that information to each player character. Maybe the fighter and the rogue, they get surrounded by cutthroats. Yeah, they, they've seen this happen plenty of times. They know what the setup is. Two guys in front, four behind, somebody with a, with a knife to their throat. Hey, give me your stuff. They've seen this happen before. The cleric? Maybe not so much. Maybe the cleric's eighth level and the fighter's third level, but the fighter's far more experienced. You give that information to them, and during your game, you can take this information and alter it to move the spotlight from one player character to another. Okay, so I'm sure there are many more points that I can, I can uh, come up with this, but these are the only highlights that I want to give you because I don't want to go f too long with this video. I want to get back to making more videos. So this is the narrative secret, the GM as the inner voice. And it is about adding expertise to your players, avoiding die rolls that are unnecessary, um, handing out the spotlight, um, kind of using the quantum ogre of railroad, which is kind of a negative thing, but if you want to refocus your player characters onto a particular path, you can do that um, using this technique. Basically, essentially saying, hey, with the knowledge you have, you're sure going through the Southern Pass is too far too dangerous, although quicker. It is far better for you to go over, over the mountain ridge, although more dangerous, knowing that enemies will be waiting for you and time is of the essence. Right? 
you're not saying this is Game Master, you must do this. You're saying, you as player characters, you know this information already. Now allow them to make that choice. Again, I'm going to reinforce. The DM has the inner voice. You can never lie to your players. They can only... They can only have the information that's available to them, and you as the DM are are shaping that as their senses. What they hear, what they see, smell, taste, touch, even the senses that aren't part of the five. They're, it's that intuition. It could be even spell-like effects through sensing magic or part of the divine or whatever abilities that they have to say, hey, while you were sleeping, you received this message. While you were praying, you swore, you, you know, you heard the words, um, Mountain Crest. And when the, the, the <clears throat> cleric goes back to the party, says, you know, I don't, I'm not sure what it is, but I don't think we should take the mountain pass. It's the easiest one, it's the most logical one, but the divine has spoken to me and says we should go over the mountains. It's far more dangerous. But in the long run, I think it'll help us out. That the player character takes that and can absorb that, right? So anyway, uh, DBJ, DeVabry and Jackson here. I'm out. I'm glad I could do another video for you. Narrative secrets. The GM as the inner voice. I hope I was clear in this one. And again, I say to everyone else out there um, who is part of the online community, who has um, touches many lives. Um, use this information. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it and for you to give this information out to others. Um, I say it's one of the top five. Um, prove me right, prove me wrong. Sure, whatever. Anyway, guys, as always, I like to end my videos with create, don't destroy. Um, create an inclusive environment. Create more stories. Be creative. Uh, don't destroy someone's love of the hobby. Don't destroy someone's uh, emotional um, in intensity and impact and um, immersion in the game uh, just say hey you want to play sure come on in be just be very zen about it okay all right guys thank you very much have a good one